Good evening. Uh, my name is Adrian Owen. Um, 22 years ago, I was introduced to a young school teacher from Cambridge in the UK. Her name was Kate. Now, Kate wasn't like you, and she wasn't like me. Uh, she was living in a state that used to be referred to, or was often referred to, as a persistent vegetative state. Kate was literally living on the boundary between life and death. She would open and close her eyes. She would occasionally stare blankly around the room. She would cough and she would yawn. But like all patients who were described as being in a vegetative state, Kate showed no responses to any form of external stimulation. If you asked her to squeeze your hand, nothing. If you asked her to blink her eyes, nothing. And again, like all patients in this condition, it was generally assumed that Kate had no awareness. That is, she wasn't aware of who she was, she wasn't aware of where she was, and she certainly wasn't aware of the predicament that she was in. Now, my colleagues and I had an idea that we would put Kate into a brain scanner and see whether we could work out what was going on with her brain. While she was in the scanner, we showed her pictures of faces of her friends and family. Now, this is something that nobody had ever done before at that point. And to be honest, most people thought we were pretty crazy. I mean, what was the point? It was a waste of time and a waste of money. But remarkably, when Kate was exposed to these uh, pictures of faces of people she knew, her brain activated. It lit up. But what did that mean? Was this some kind of automatic brain response, a sort of an echo from the abyss, or... Was this a sign that there was something more going on in Kate's brain than any of us knew? Well, to be really honest, uh, I had absolutely no idea uh, back then, but we did know that we had discovered something that was potentially very important. Now, over the next few years, uh, I saw many patients who were like Kate, and we put them into brain scanners, and, and we saw all sorts of responses, responses to pictures, responses to words, sentences, even complete stories but still we didn't know what these brain signs meant. What did it mean when somebody's brain responded to a familiar stimulus that we presented to them? Again, was there more going on in the brains of these patients than any of us had up until that point realized? And it was in, it was in 2006 that we really had our major breakthrough. I realized that if we were going to truly understand what was going on for these patients, we'd have to get one of them to communicate with us. And not to communicate with speech or, or movements, uh, because of course none of these patients could do that. But the question was, could we get a patient to communicate using just their brain? Now Gillian was uh, a patient who, uh, who I saw in 2006 who had been involved in a complex road traffic accident. And when she came to our attention, she'd been in a vegetative state for some months. We put Gillian into the scanner and we said, if you understand what we're saying to, to you now, could you imagine that you're waving your arms around as if you were playing a game of tennis? And remarkably, when we asked Gillian to do this, an area of her brain known as the premotor cortex, it's right up here on top of your brain, uh, it sprung to life. And that's a part of the brain that we know is involved in imagining complex movements, as if you were imagining playing a game of tennis. And when we asked Gillian to stop thinking about this, activity in this area of the brain disappeared. And we repeated this many times. She was able to produce these responses, not, not physical responses, but responses with her brain whenever we asked her to do it. Gillian was conscious. Gillian was in there. She was aware. She just hadn't been able to move a single muscle in her body to indicate this to anybody around her. Now, in 2010, I moved my research team from the University of Cambridge to uh, Western University in London, Ontario, and within a month of arriving in Canada, I was introduced to another patient called Scott. Now, like Gillian, Scott had been involved in a, a complicated uh, road accident, but unlike Gillian, he'd been in a vegetative state for 12 years at the point that we met him. And very quickly, uh, I was able to tell Scott's family and his doctors that he wasn't in a vegetative state at all. He was actually aware. And this is because when we asked him to imagine doing something in the scanner, imagine playing a game of tennis, his brain would activate in much the same way that we had seen 
previously. But we wanted to push it further than that. We wanted to open a channel of communication so that some of these patients could actually communicate with us. And Scott showed us how to do that. Over a series of uh, many scans, over many months, we taught Scott to communicate, to answer yes and no questions. He would typically imagine he was playing a game of tennis if he wanted to answer yes to a question, or imagine a different scenario, such as moving from room to room in his house, if he wanted to, for example, say no, or answer no to a question. And in this way, we were able to find out many things about Scott, about the situation he was in, about how he felt about that, about some of the memories that he uh, had and some of his needs um, uh, and desires, including whether he was in any pain. Now, over the last 20 years or so, since we, uh, since we did that original scan, we've learned many, many things about this population of patients. Uh, many uh, different uh, centers around the world now use these techniques to identify patients uh, who are in this condition and even to communicate with them. And it turns out that about uh, one in five or 20 percent of patients who appear to be completely vegetative, completely non-responsive, are in fact aware. And in many cases, uh, for decades, have been lying silently listening to every conversation going on around them. And you might be wondering what happened to Kate, that school teacher in Cambridge, who started this cascade of events that's led me uh, to be here today. Well, uh, again, remarkably, uh, after uh, some months, some months after we scanned her, Kate began to recover. And she's talked very publicly about the many uh, struggles she had coming back from uh, that boundary between uh, life and death. She's described how she tried to kill herself by holding her breath. She had uh, no other way uh, of doing it. She's also talked about uh, the, the tremendous stress, the terror, actually, she says, of being aware in the presence of other people who have no idea that you are there at all. But for me, the most important thing that Kate has taught me over the last uh, 20 years or so um, is that she says the day that we scanned her is the day that she became a person again. It's the day when people stopped treating her like an object and started to treat her like a human being. And that's why we do what we do. I and mean, this all began, for, for me anyway, uh, about almost 30 years ago now as a, a journey to try and unravel the mysteries of the brain. But it's turned into something much more interesting and much more personal uh, as we try and, and pull these people uh, back from the void, try and give them a voice and reconnect them with the people that they love and the, the people who, who love them. And ultimately, um, bring them back uh, and give them a place where they belong back in the land of the living. Thanks very much.